from the hospitals, both in rural and urban settings. So that's a very crucial point when we're discussing tech. Of course, Mr. Timothy on my left, representing government. Uh, current Deputy Director of the State Department of ICT and Innovation, so we'll focus on that. Your technical leader, of course, you have experience within the field, education, training, telecommunication. So you can give us all the perspective and then give us what's happening within government and making sure everything is in place. Lisa Karanja, to my extreme left, I hope the arm is fine. To the arm is fine. Through the whole session, everyone will be talking about your arm. Uh, of course, the Kenya Country Head for the Tony Blair Institute, 20 years of experience, law, trade, regional integration in, the, uh, in East Africa, of course, worked in the UK, the US, trademark East Africa, uh, among very many positions you've held. Wawera, Wawera Jiro, a good friend. When you think of the phrase, a hungry nation cannot grow, you think of Wawera. Exactly, and we, we know exactly what that means, especially with the new uh, administration that will take over even for this year in Kenya. So 2020 Ford Foundation Global Fellow, multiple award winner, uh, UN Kenya Person of the Year, we could go on and on. But you also have the F4E Food for Education, providing over 6.5 million meals across 25 schools within the last decade. So we're in good hands, guys. We're in very good hands. Let's start off with you, Aurora, since we started, uh, we gave such a warm welcome to you last. When you think of the tech ecosystem, or the tech startup ecosystem uh, in Africa, you, you, do, you do both. You do a lot of hands-on, you now have the time to eat, you tell us a lot more about that. How solid is the current ecosystem we have in Kenya, in the region, on the continent, to inform what the future holds. Hi everyone, um, what a big question to start with. And I'll try to speak for the entire ecosystem and my perspective on it. So, I mean, first of all, I come to this conversation as a non-technology person, as just someone who uses technology to deliver a service. So uh, what Georgie alluded to is Tap to Eat, a system that we developed that provides meals to that we use to provide meals to kids. So luckily I'm wearing one today, uh, just because I'm from the field, and it's essentially a wristband, an NFC wristband. And it's good to be in a tech crowd, because sometimes I say NFC and people are like, what is NFC? But I'm sure everyone here understands the NFC. Just in case they don't understand. Just in case, for the non-technology people like me. <laughs> um, NFC is you know, the credit card technology, in the same way that you tap when you pay for something, is that chip? that we just put in a wristband. So we use that to validate you know, parents prepay, we create an e-wallet for the meals that we provide, and through that e-wallet they make micropayments of 15 shillings per meal, and this is how they're validated. So I think that the tech ecosystem is, um, for now what I would say is as an outsider I feel sometimes, uh, in the tech system, but someone who uses technology, is that it's coming more into developing solutions, everyday solutions for people. And for example, what Food for Education is doing, what Liga, for example, what Damusasa, Pathology Kenya, all these organizations, looking at how do we use technology to change everyday lives? How do we use it to create solutions for everyday problems we all know exist? And so I think the tech ecosystem is broadening from just coders and developers to people who now in incorporate technology because we know we can't live without it in a way that provides, for example, for us, food every single day to 30,000 children. So that's my perception. Right, perfect. So I'm sure we've all heard, um, whenever people are trying to compare what's happening within the tech system here, they say, you know, you want the Amazon of Africa, you want the Facebook of Africa, you want what? So alluding to the fact that we don't have as many competitive tech uh, or organizations or tech companies coming up that might battle the rest that are coming from the rest of the world, but then you have the flutter waves and you have the you know market Africa that have just announced maybe $40 million in funding for Series A as the biggest B2B marketplace in Africa, which is very competitive. But I'll ask the question to Aaron. Um, within your field, not so many people do that, right? So your competitive edge might be different from someone in ag or any other field. Speak to us about this element of being competitive within Africa's technical system that most people don't quite understand. Thank you very much. And uh, speaking of competition, 
especially in uh, our space, uh, Damusasa, is what I like to call, so there's two types of competition. There is a competition you can see, and there's competition you cannot see. So the competition you can see is someone else or another product that is, uh, you know, interested in serving the same client that you want. The one competition that you cannot see and which is usually the most dangerous is the one, you know, based on culture. So what was your customer doing before you, before even your other seen competition? So that is usually the biggest, you know, competition that it's almost like you're fighting shadows because you have to do a lot of effort, a lot of groundwork in order to shift your client mentally from doing what they used to do and to come on board now to doing what you're proposing. And being in Africa, uh, you know, we're one of the places where the digital era has, you know, really taken, uh, taken off. However, we still have these segments where uh, ICT has not yet fully been uh, taken up. And that's where the challenge comes in, especially in our case where we deal with, uh, you know, linking or making sure that patients get, you know, safe blood and blood products for transfusion, and especially mothers uh, and children. And it becomes hard to do this, especially in areas that are far removed, you know, from urban centers. So we even launched um, a USSD platform to be able to serve, uh, you know, frontline healthcare workers in terms of how do they access information that would then end up leading them to sourcing for blood and blood products for their patients. So it's always innovating to try and deal with the unseen uh, competition. That's how I do it. Right, so how, uh, you mentioned the competition that we can't see. How people say the biggest competitor for Netflix is sleep. Right, exactly. Okay, so let's move on to one more person before we hear from uh, Lisa. Joshua, would it the same phrase, the same um, Round, rounds uh, to think, you, have, you now have your setup in different environments, right? So let's think about that because we're here from government and the TBI. You have the rural setting and the urban setting. So that's like dealing with two completely different ecosystems, right? So whenever we talk about startups, we have to really compartmentalize the solutions. But let us hear from your perspective. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what about. So our company, Health Network, uh, links uh, hospitals that need critical diagnostic pathology, like, uh, for example, they've done a surgery and they don't know whether the tissue is cancerous or not. And they need a pathologist. So we take that tissue, we, we order for the test online, and then we then take that tissue ourselves take it to a lab, and then distribute it among pathologists. Our hospitals uh, are spread across both rural areas, like you said, and urban areas. We've not, I personally, not found um, a very big difference in, in that, um, it, 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 between the behavior or the need, because the need is a healthcare need, and it's a prevalent across the industry. Whether you know, I don't think the need is any less. Um, that's what I found. I initially actually thought that the need was more in the rural areas, but actually the need is everywhere. Um, and I think sometimes you find that the urban poor are even more disadvantaged than the rural poor who have maybe strong social supports. And so I'm not sure if the distinction between separating a startup that is solving a genuine problem, saying that these are rural startups, these are urban startups, whether that's a real distinction. Uh, that's just my thinking. Noted. Let me get, because we've spoken about three, three uh, different businesses we have here, let me get from you and from Moria, of course we'll hear from Aaron as well, one challenge you face within your business, just one challenge. Within your business, Joshua. Oh, me? Yes. Just yes. one challenge. One challenge at the face. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for making it difficult. 
maybe uh, talent. The talent. Sourcing talent. Sourcing talent. Yes. Okay, what we have? Digital literacy. Digital literacy. Black donor apathy. Sorry? Black donor apathy. Black donor apathy. Wow. Black donor apathy, digital awareness, and talents. Which brings us now to Mr. Timothy. <laughs> so, we've laid out what the issues could be, but we'd love to hear from you. How comfortable are you when you sit within your dockets, understanding the kind of work that you've done, and knowing maybe the, what the next step is for innovation and the startup ecosystem in Kenya and in the region, having those particular issues just being highlighted right next to you. How comfortable are we with the current ecosystem? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the government has come in very strongly. There's been a realization that um, ICT is an enabler. ICT will spur the economy. ICT is the economy. And so from the government perspective, what um, we are looking at is multifaceted. The first is regulation. All these players need a level playing field. They need direction. They need a referee. So the government has come in very strongly with the rules, the laws, and the regulations to enable the ecosystem to prosper and thrive. Uh, just uh, this week, we've been talking about uh, national payments strategy. And uh, that's now um, the government trying to embrace cryptocurrency. The government has been very cautious and slow, but I think um, things are moving very fast. And so the government also has to enter the fray very fast. Uh, you know, we have the Computer and Cyber Crimes Act. Those are very recent ones, the Data Protection Act. Yeah. Uh, in the works is the critical infrastructure protection bill. So the government is trying to secure uh, the ICT environment. In addition, we talk about the digital uh, divide or the gap. Uh, the government is trying to lay the infrastructure with more emphasis in the rural areas. So there's been um, connectivity infrastructure targeting the county headquarters, uh, trying to take um, technology down to the rural areas because we find that um, because of the concentration in the urban areas, uh, uh, the urban areas are very well served. Yeah. But uh, through the universal service funds and also through government infrastructure projects, we are trying to ensure that the government offices uh, in the rural areas are connected. This has covered all the county headquarters and now we are going to the sub-counties, that's the plan. Uh, there's also the constituency innovation hubs where the youth are given some lab facilities where they can be able to experiment and maybe do some online work. It's an ongoing process uh, that is carried out together with the legislators. <laughs> So all this um, is happening. There's a lot of um, uh, training and literacy in the judiciary, in the police, just trying to arbitrate and trying to bring them up to speed so that whenever there are any disputes, whenever there are any competition challenges in the ICT space, then they can be able to intervene. Right. Can someone in the room just tell me one thing that was not mentioned? Just one thing that affects every startup regardless of the country you're in. From the, anyone? Yes? Thank you so much. One of the challenges that uh, came up from the panel was um, skill sets. And uh, as you talked, I've not had any to do with capacity building. But, uh, Okay. Building of skills. So capacity building, but there's one more thing that was not mentioned. Let me just mention it. The costs. The cost to set up any startup or any tech startup or anything within the ecosystem. We'd really love to hear from you, especially as a country that's leading the rest of the region and even possibly the, the continent on having the least possible costs for anyone who's coming into this world. 
Tell us a bit about that. Okay. Uh, maybe just quickly on the capacity building. Uh, the school curriculum now has a lot of ICT. Um, uh, there are all these programs, uh, presidential digital talent for graduates. Um, uh, the universities are being encouraged to incorporate ICT, even in non-ICT courses. So the conversation on capacity building is actually ongoing. Uh, for the costs, there are several ways in which the government is trying to bridge this gap. First of all, there are loans that have been availed for businesses and not necessarily in ICT, any business. So the tech startups are welcome to be able to apply for the ways of funds to be able to, you know, um, uh, uh, push their businesses to uh, better heights. There's also um, the collaboration with the members of parliament. The constituency innovation hubs, apart from just being uh, labs, they offer free connectivity. The ICT authority has been trying to train um, um, youth on online engagements and trying to link them up with people who have online work. So these are some of the ways in which the government is trying to bridge this gap. All right, let's hear from uh, Lisa before we turn out to the audience. Uh, please just prepare your questions and then we can take it up from there. Uh, Lisa, finally, of course, the Tony Blair Institute has the roadmap to supercharging Africa's tech uh, startup uh, ecosystem and they'll focus on improving the business environment, reaching $90 million in tech financing within the next eight years, and then strengthening, strengthening support networks. Let's focus on the tech financing potential. Uh, within, the, within that report, it says that you require new investment tools, right, to make sure that you reach that potential and reach that particular funding within the next eight years. Just help us, given your background and the work that you've done with TBI, understand what these new potential investment tools could be, given that we're already not quite doing the most with what we already, we currently have. Okay, and um, I'll probably also ask some, some of our members of our policy team to speak to that as well. But the Tony Blair Institute, really what we're doing is, we, um, for those who don't know, we um, embed ourselves within governments um, across the world in order to help um, them to pursue their priorities. Um, and here in Kenya, what we're doing specifically although we do work with investment potential for all the ministries that we're working with, what we're doing specifically is supporting the Ministry of Agriculture and supporting the Ministry of Health in terms of their initiatives and also the Ministry of ICT in terms of their in initiatives, particularly around um, the Ag Data Platform and within the Ministry of Health, we're looking at a digital health platform. And we have our tech star over there, Michelle Mwongogo, who's actually leading on those efforts. Um, so, you know, we do look at the investment potential, um, we do try and convene global investment um, to look at uh, funding into Kenya, startups in Kenya and so on, but um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult road, it's, um, it's about bringing in, um, you know, the, the, the value from um, elsewhere into Kenya. Um, and, and around the world, and in fact we work globally around the world. We have an entire um, international um, tech team that works on that. I think there's um, the policy people here, um, over there, who really um, developed that report. Um, but that's what we're doing in Kenya. Um, and we're looking to do, to impact the country in areas of um, key reform, you know, food security, health, universal health care, and we're looking at huge impacts. We're trying to look at how can we get to 10 times um, the impact. Uh, and that's, 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 you know, we have um, a, an ag tech advisor who's working shoulder to shoulder within the Ministry of Agriculture. We have, we're going to have a team within um, the health ministry. There are obviously challenges when you're working with governments. Um, I should be polite. <laughs> but there are obviously challenges when, when you're working with governments. But I think, you know, there is, there is very strong political will. And I think this program will 
hopefully grow um, and manage to go into other areas where we can support tech. You know, some of the challenges that we face are siloed, siloed initiatives, lack of interconnectivity between initiatives, lack of interconnectivity into the rural areas. So um, these are the areas that we're trying to support in the ministries. Okay, fantastic perspective from the panelists. For the interest of time, we'd like to get the questions from the audience. Any questions? We'll just get them as quickly as possible from the back. I guess someone. Is your hand raised? Is that question there? Yeah, there's one there. Please just say your name and who the question is addressed to. Um, hi, my name is Comfort Wendra. And I have the first of Georgie. The coordination is something else. Um, so, Joshua, this is a question to you. I you talked about um, the competition with culture and electrical and it's difficult because also work to with SMEs to digitize businesses and these the switching costs that come with that, you know, trying to get people to adopt uh, from your experience how you tackling that, you know, any tips and tricks. And also to the government, I like the work that you're doing, but I feel like it's more reactive, you know. It's you're noticing um, that you know crypto is coming in, so the government's trying to do that. It, do you have strategies in place for, according to the trends, you know, for what's going to happen ten years from now, and then putting um, the structure for that as opposed to seeing what's coming in and then trying to build for that. Thank Perfect. You. So working backwards, right? So do you, you want to want to take the question? Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that question. However, actually, just Aaron who mentioned the culture. Uh, so, give it over to you. Not that we haven't seen the same thing, but I think uh, Chris mentioned it. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, one of the things we've actually tried to, to do, you know, in terms of getting people to do the mental shift from you know, what they used to do to what we are uh, proposing, and uh, I'd like to start by saying, what normally happens is that when innovators or solution providers go into a space, uh, the way to get into that space or the way to get accepted into that space is to try not and change so much, you know, what they're already doing. So take a case of, you know, a hospital, for example, other requests for their blood products. So when we went in, we looked at what forms, pre-existing forms, do they fill in for example, you know, as they're requesting for those uh, products. And we imitated our platforms to those, uh, you know, particular forms. And it wasn't before long when we started having challenges of people wanting to go back, you know, to what they used to do. So what we did uh, in our case was to try now look at that original form, then now look at how can we make that form even simpler now that we're going to the uh, digital side. So we had to reinvent and, uh, you know, engineer new ways of filling certain types of uh, information, you know, with the key goal being how do we make it easier. So from my experience, especially dealing with uh, health workers, I know Joshua Kibera is a doctor here, forgive me here, uh, is that most of the times you find that it's very uh, tough or hard to get health workers to see something in a new, uh, you know, new light, and usually it's on our part as solution providers or innovators to try and make it as simple as possible. And one other thing about uh, healthcare uh, providers or health people in the healthcare space is that most of the times they will do when 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 push comes to shove. Sometimes they will do the best they can. And usually the best they can is to avoid. So that's what I've learned, you know, in this space for that time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. There was a question directed to you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, Comfort. Um, it is true that the government may appear reactive, but that's because ICT is relatively new, and I think governments usually are slow to adopt uh, new things. 
Well, this, just let us stop right there. This is the first time in my life I'm hearing the government admit anything. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just acknowledge that. Please carry on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, governments have their ways of operating. So for it to change, there's a lot of convincing and a lot of things that have to take place. But the government has realized that ICT is a force to reckon with and it just has to get uh, onto the bandwagon. So there's a digital economy blueprint that has been adopted by the government and has been incorporated into the uh, medium term plan for the Vision 2030. And here the government is looking at a digital government, digital infrastructure, entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, digital skills and values, and this is a regional group blueprint uh, being championed by both Kenya and Rwanda. And there's a component of it in the African uh, AU, because there's a component of ICT also uh, in the AU. So the government is currently moving and working very well uh, with partners. There are, uh, what I'd say, the regulations. Our laws and regulations are very, uh, what can I say, modern now. They compare very well. For instance, very many countries still don't have data protection and, uh, laws. We've already adopted that and we've even set up the commission. Uh, the Communications Authority does a lot of regulation and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, checks in the ICT field. We have the ICT authority and of course we have the ministry. By the way, the State Department for ICT is relatively new. It came into being in 2016. Yeah. So the government is fast catching up and I think through partnerships like this, we are upping our game. Um, uh, whatever policy that we are coming up with in any sphere always considers the ICT aspect and ICT inclusion. And through such interaction, I'm sure we'll be able to catch up by and by. Okay. Yes. Maybe just to add, add on that. I think um, the government is an institution that's made up of people who have come from us, from our population. And, and um, it's very easy to point fingers at the government, but really um, it's a reflection of us as a society. Uh, so I think that it's, you know, we are the young innovators, we are the ones who have these companies. I think it's good to support the government with new ideas. Uh, uh, for example, of, um, uh, with the pathology network ourselves, we volunteer to be part of technical working groups. You know, we have no charge really because it's in our interest that the government makes policies that are well informed, and we're the ones that are on the ground. So, it's if you have an idea that could possibly help the, the, the government, I think it's good citizenry and it's good for the ecosystem. And then maybe the second thing that I would, I would say is that um, uh, just on, on uh, as a business idea, maybe somebody will take it up. One of the challenges that I have, you know, is starting off as an entrepreneur, is that there is no information on the internet about setting up a tech business in Kenya. Um, it's not there, I'm not saying uh, that the government would not have done it, um, I'm sure you could, I'm just saying that us as people who, who now walk the path and have struggled to, to figure it out on a, uh, you know, through the trenches, if there was a Wikipedia, for example, of business that tells you uh, these, are the, these are the challenges uh, in, in different ways, it would be very useful. Um, and, and I think the investors would also um, uh, have something to contribute. Uh, so you find these Western investors will come and they have uh, a certain uh, you know, cultural or, or, or legal background that they've come from, and we don't understand that. So the, the Kenyan entrepreneurs don't have that background, and there is no, there's nothing to translate that. So um, that would 
be great just to have that kind of an information portal that helps young entrepreneurs who already have good ideas and what's standing in between them is this information of these like recommended steps uh, to, to, to yeah. Perfect, thank you. Very valid point. Let me give you just one more to add on to that, and if it happens, take one percent royalty since we're also startups in Italy. Um, in Kigali, and which passed on to Senegal, also for Africa and Francophone Africa. So in in Rwanda, what they did, um, commissioned by one of these big banks, they of course the size of the country allowed them to do that, but they called most of the key stakeholders within the startup ecosystem into a room, and they asked everyone. What are the challenges you face? What are the costs you, you incur? Where do you, where do you supply to? Where do you get your materials from? Where do you intend your business to be, to be? And that was about three to five years ago, and then they did a whole white paper, a proper white paper that now is going to be commissioned, of course, by parliament, and it will be the startup book, you know? So like kind of a startup Bible. So Kenya, of course, has a lot more variables at play, but we are also a lot more advanced within our ecosystem. So that is one possibility for free, no charge. No charge to government. You can take my taxes, I charge nothing. So let's let's take let's take one one more question, please. One more question or two more questions and then we can have the final round of them of the panelists saying something. Do we have anything? Right? Or at the back? Please, your name and who you're addressing it to. I would love to hear more from Lisa as well. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Utiena Uma. Mine is not particularly a question, but uh, a comment from a policy perspective, uh, and particularly on one of the challenges that is facing uh, startups. In 2021 January, uh, the country passed the digital services tax, and this tax applies to income that is derived from uh, services offered in a digital marketplace. Ideally, this is a space that allows direct interaction between uh, buyers and sellers of uh, goods and services. Now, this tax applies in Kenya irrespective of whether you are a startup, and as we've, uh, we've had, most of these startups are engaging in, uh, uh, they're offering these services online. When you compare this with other countries, uh, developed uh, jurisdictions like, uh, for instance, the UK, they have a very clear uh, uh, method of imposing such tax so that the small businesses are not subjected to this tax because ideally you'd be taking away the little income that they are deriving in the digital market space. So I think as a country, this is one of the areas that we, from a policy perspective, we need to look at and particularly that tax, because most of the startups right now are in the ICT sector or they are offering their services in the non-traditional manner. I think this is something that as a government, uh, as a country, the government needs to look at. That was just my comment. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much for that perspective. Is there any other question we're locking out? Yeah, there's one there. We have about five minutes before we wrap up. Um, I have a question for Aaron. Um, I think you mentioned that one of the challenges that you're facing is the lack of talent. And yet on the other hand, the ministry is saying that they're investing a lot in revamping the curriculum. And when you go online, there are literally hundreds of thousands of graduates who are coming online, um, graduating every year, not able to find jobs. So the question is, where is the disconnect? And I think this is a question that I'd like to see answered from the industry perspective, but also from the government perspective today. Aaron? Well, thank you, but uh, I don't know why this is happening, but this was meant for Joshua. So I'm going to Joshua. <laughs> so to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. They must confuse us. We must look alike. Yeah, uh, so yes, talent is a big issue um, for us, uh, and I'm not saying you're absolutely right, you're graduating thousands of people every single uh, year, uh, however, this, this seems to be like a skills mismatch, so you find a lot of people who graduate are in 
uh, have done you know diplomas in in uh, accounting or in business administration or in something and I need you know a software engineer or I need um, uh, a, senior, a senior person in finance or I need somebody who's uh, you know who, who who can fill in some key positions in our company and so um, at as a, at a certain level, you get a mismatch in the sense that the talent that's available in the market is really limited and there's a lot of competition. Um, and the bigger companies, of course, can offer more money and uh, they can choke us, uh, the rest of us. So it's a real challenge for a young tech startup to attract good quality talent to build uh, what we want to build. So yeah, um, that's where we are. And so it's not that we don't have young graduates. Uh, sometimes it's uh, that we don't have experienced people. Sometimes we find that if you want even junior developers, uh, you don't have the, the resources to train them internally uh, because you still need a senior person to, to uh, mentor them or provide that um, supervision. Yeah. Would you want to speak about the disconnect? Okay, yeah, there, there is a disconnect and maybe it goes back to the slow reaction that I was talking about, but we now have more of uh, industry linkages with the uh, tertiary institutions to be able to come up with uh, more industry-oriented manpower. Uh, the younger people are also very adventurous. I think the older people stuck to traditional disciplines, but now we see people are uh, venturing online, doing their own uh, self-paced study. People are uh, more into ICT, more into the new technologies, not that ICT. And the universities are also taking note and uh, offering these uh, new courses. So people are moving towards that. The government is also trying to reskill, especially its own workers, through continuous training and uh, programs. Um, uh, the new curriculum, it has really been vilified, uh, but it has a lot of interesting things. And if it is well implemented, then the people who will graduate from this will be more attuned to what is happening around them. Thank you, thank you very much. Lisa, let's hear from you as the last person about this disconnect, right? So we have government level, because you work with governments, then policies and then the startups themselves. We know the startups work in silos. Uh, very, uh, we see it a bit disjointed, and then we've heard about the disconnect with governments. But maybe from an advisory point of view, or when you sit from outside, what do you think we could work on or tweak a few things? Um, I think one of the things is, yes, we need to do more convening. Um, between government and private sector. Um, I, see, I see government trying to look at this disconnect and actually I've been quite impressed by the number of young people that are working in technological areas within government offices um, and the number of people with tech backgrounds that are, sorry, your hands, and the number of tech people um, within the government as well. And there are really some strong efforts to look at, particularly the youth, and how that they, they should engage with the youth, for example, your Jira program and all of that. Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of startups, you know, the, they will go around the government, right? So they don't see, some of them don't see the utility of working with government. Um, and, you know, I'm not a techie person, so I'm glad that somebody else on the panel said they're not techie either. So I want to, you know, everybody to know that. Um, but I think they, they go around it because they don't see the utility and the conversation needs to be had. And I think that that convening role that TBI can play and which we want to increasingly play is very, very important to ensure that the government is actually addressing the real challenges that startups are facing. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's, there'll be some very traditional trajectories taken. Um, and, you know, part of our role is bringing those voices together. Um, whether at a global level or at a local level, um, and you know, our, we our central policy team is one of is is one of the ways in which we try and help shape policies. So, for example, in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health, we're working with them 
um, on their uh, policies around digital health. Um, so I think you've just got to bring people into the conversation. I think this kind of thing is um, very important um, to feedback the government, but for startups to also understand what the government is doing. Because sometimes um, it's not the best communicator. So, sorry, it's not the best communicator. So sometimes you'll look into government and be very surprised at the thinking, at how modern it is, at how innovative it is. Uh, you'll be very surprised at some of the initiatives. I keep asking Nyambura um, in your ministry, why aren't you talking about these things more? Um, you know, why, why don't people know that this is what you're doing in government? Um, so I think having that conversation, having the convening, you know, bringing startups to talk to the government, bringing, um, you know, the, the, the whole ecosystem together in this kind of way on a regular basis, I think is critical. Because I think that communication is lost. And I, we see both sides. And we can see what, pe the, you know, what people on one side have misconceptions about, and we can see what misconceptions there are about government. So I think that's a, a very important role. Perfect. Thank you very much. I really can appreciate all of you enough. We have just one last exercise. The last question we're going to ask the panelists, but you'll answer it in only one sentence, is um, what does the future of startups look like in your industry? Now, we know that might be tough for you to answer in one question, so I'll help you with this. I, I'd love to walk around. So, for the camera guys, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll come around and ask you a question. What, what do you think can be fixed in any particular industry or anything that you guys normally do in your day to day? I'll ask all of you, and you have to give me one answer that you think tech can solve, so that anyone coming up with an idea for a startup or whatnot can know exactly what they're working on. I'll start. I think Kenya's startup ecosystem or Kenya's ICT space can fix our postal service. Right? There we go. I think they can fix our postal service. Too, too, too close? Okay. Uh, so I'm being shushed. Are you shush, shooting me? Are you shooting me? What do you, what do you think? Not from Kenya. Ideally. You know, okay, you know what? I'm reaching. Uh, ah, here we go. What do you think can be changed within a startup or tech ecosystem? Wow. Please don't perform. Don't perform. That's a hard question for me because I must be prepared. Um, You're also a Kenyan. What do you think the tech ecosystem can fix in your day-to-day -day life? They can fix in my day-to-day -day life. Okay, royalty collection. Royalty collection. Okay, music. There we go, royalty collection. Uh huh. The education system. Um, to go more way. Than the fiscal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Even if you don't look my side, I still know where you're seated. <laughs> Can I ask you the question? Oh, what do you think? the tech of a system, at least within the region, can change in your day-to-day -day life? Um, construction, in the construction industry, especially uh, road maintenance for public services, so that government in real time can know which roads are what roads. If a bridge is broken, government should know real time. And then also this information should go to other citizens so that they can better prepare and plan their work. All right, there we go. Okay, okay, okay. Three ideas. We have to, I mean, for purposes of quality, we have to ask, yeah, please, what do you think the technical system in the region can fix in your day-to-day -day life? When I see an ecosystem, what I'm going to call ecosystem. It's an ecosystem when it comes to this. This is being finalized quite uh, faster. So where we have a system, a case is placed, so by three months a case is finalized. If it does not succeed, it's a process that it takes. Instead of places where we are in 1998 and places in 2017 are still being had. Just a system where it's efficient, um, judiciary, we do not get notices where judges are not around. It's just a kind of efficient system. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, 
to my on my point of view and what we've been experiencing as startups. Um, for example, uh, the government would want to commission for a certain software or whatever. They would go for the companies that have been there for 10, 15 years and they will not give opportunities to the startups. And we find that maybe that those companies, they don't have the technology that we even have right now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Really bad, I'm sorry. Uh, so for me, it's information sharing and the importance of that, which I think is really important even when attracting investors from other countries when they're coming to Kenya. So we do not have a single platform where we can they can see uh, which startups are in Kenya, exactly where they are, their offices, uh, where they are located, and also equally for the startups, uh, where the VCs are or people they can plug into the ecosystem. So this is being done uh, separately by private institutions, but we really like the government to come and plug and put a stamp on such a platform that will enable information sharing. Thank you. I cannot appreciate you enough. Please, a warm round of applause. Um, the reason we did that ex exercise, hi. The reason we did that exercise, even for those of us that shoot us, is because we're still working in a lot of silos. Right? We're very, we have very disjointed mentalities and very disjointed mindsets. So we need, we've already gotten five ideas. Five, cost free, you know, to everyone. And we've gotten everyone and we'll get your final thoughts. But if we can work a bit more jointed within our idea system, then we can actually formulate something that works more sustainably. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Thank you. I was listening and I was thinking that a lot of the organizations, these startups, need to be bold. They need to be rhinoceros to residents. They need to step up and actually solve difficult things for government. If we're talking about water, if we're talking about electricity, if we're talking about health, what Damusasa, what Damusasa has done is actually addressing such problems. Just stepping up and actually being consistently uh, and persisting on trying to solve those problems. And that is what I think the ecosystem here has to do because I think they're still a bit too shy. Question, you, you made a bit of a reaction when you talked about the postal services. Why, why is that? Because we're helping them do exactly that. We're doing exactly that. Yeah. And the postal service. Yes. <laughs> right, so final word, kindly. We'll start off, of course, uh, Joshua and Envoya. Please just give us one line. Where do you think, what do you think is the future of startups in your industry? Let's ask that. Well, to be honest, uh, I can't do this in one line, but and, and honestly speaking, it would be a disservice, you know, to come to such a platform and not say some of the things that I think need to be, to be changed. And I'll start by saying that uh, first and foremost, the future is bright, but then our actions between now and then, even to that future, need to change in order for us to achieve that future, otherwise it will always be a bright future, the key word being future, okay? So one of the things, uh, if you look at, you know, the funding, we have a problem in uh, lack of risk funding or risk capital. So sometimes in order to come up with the perfect solution, mistakes must be made. And the question always becomes, who's going to pay for these mistakes? You can bootstrap all you want, but at the end of the day, you still need help. And this is where government has to come in because banks don't want to pay for mistakes. Investors don't want to pay for mistakes. So government is actually the biggest innovation engine that is yet to start performing at an optimum level, but I'm happy he says that they're now you know, getting into the bandwagon. Number two is the fact that we lack structures that nurture innovations. So in this country, for example, we run annually in secondary schools a science congress. So you win the science congress, you get your trophy, we clap for you, we call it a day. I think I've got one of those. Yeah, so where do those innovations go? They need a place you know, where they can be taken out. The other thing we need is uh, you know, test beds. We need test beds to test our solutions because what happens most of the time is that you sit in an office, uh, you know, maybe you're being incubated somewhere, you come up with you know, a solution based on theorized uh, you know, facts 
but then you never really get that opportunity to go to a real life situation. So if I'm in banking, for example, I come up with you know, banking innovation and I walk to a bank, they're going to tell me get out of here. So I don't know whether you know, government can find a way where, so if I'm an equity bank, I come and say, I have you know, participated in helping a number of startups do test tests in our bank, so I deserve this percent of discount maybe on my taxes. I don't know if that you know, can, uh, can, can, be done, can be done. The other thing that uh, needs to change also is how we Kenyans or we Africans view the funding space. So most of the funding that comes into this country into innovations or to startups locally, uh, locally it is funding that is internationally sourced. You see, so we have to look at ourselves also inside because if we start by not believing in ourselves, then it makes it hard for people from outside to also believe in ourselves. Then last but not least is you know just being able to showcase Kenya as a city of Savannah. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, will travel to Dubai, like last the, the, we had the Dubai Expo, who will showcase, you know, magical Kenya, you know, the tourism we have, who will showcase, you know, our agriculture, the horticulture, the flower industry. But then where is tech? We need to also showcase tech in such, you know, fora, in order for even the world to start looking at us as, uh, you know, people who can, uh, you know, can be invested in and people who can actually play a role in the world, uh, you know, space when it comes to uh, innovation. One more thing, one more thing. If you look at companies like Seriano, they've reported that, you know, in a, in a few years to come, we will have gaps in terms of maybe say something like cyber security skills or be and fulfill jobs in cyber security. So what we, I think, need to start doing as a country, and he talked about universities being encouraged to take up ICT, it would be good to now start developing you know, programs and curricula that teach such uh, you know, things, because usually innovation is based on approaching problems with at least a primary set of knowledge you know, towards a certain field. So it would be good, for example, you know, in this country, we have very many universities, very many uh, tertiary institutions of education, but if you count how many, for example, offer cyber security as a single course, I'm not sure you end up very many. So that's one of the things we need to, to do. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, please. Over um, So I, I am of the perspective that government is a follower and not a leader. Uh, and that's not just Kenya, that's across the world. And so I think that one thing that startups need to do is really be, I think someone said foolish, in terms of leading the way and showing what is possible. I mean, you spoke about Expo, and during Expo you'd see there was a, the Kenya Pavilion had a lot of startups, uh, like Twiga and uh, other startups like I think, you know, M-Pesa for example. But, the reality is these startups are not thriving because of the environment the government has created. They're, they're thriving despite of the environment that has been created. And so I think it's for us to, st to stay in forums like this and to keep saying and to keep pushing and saying that, for example, there's need for local investment. There's need for uh, um, startups to be able to raise capital here. Why do we always have to go to Silicon Valley? For example, I learned how to do do a business plan in Silicon Valley and not here. Why was that not available here? And so I think that it's startups to stay in the game and to keep saying we need this and to keep pushing for those conversations. When you have a tech startup from groups, something like that? No, no, no. one. Okay, here's one. There we go. What I can say in the diagnostic space in which the pathology network is. In the next 20 years, it will be completely unrecognizable from what it is today. Um, tech will flip it on its head, it will be a completely different um, uh, space. And the, the, the thing is, is not whether that will happen, it's who will be the driver of, of that in the space. And um, uh, there is an interesting book by uh, Peter Thiel. Set, uh, called uh, Zero to One, and um, for, for those who've read it, 
and, and I think the thing is, is that the next, and in it he makes the argument that the next Amazon, the next Facebook, the next Google will not be like Google. The next, it'll, it will not be something that you can recognize today. Yes. And so, and that becomes a paradox. Because if you can't recognize it, then how do you know to support it? And so, um, some of the most crazy ideas that we can't really understand today are actually going to be the ones that will rule tomorrow. Okay, fantastic perspective. I don't know whether we finish, or oh, let's, let's go here so it's less pressure. Please, just one last thing. Given this, let me ask you this. How optimistic are you? You came, I'm, I'm guessing you leave a changed man. Let's start from there. Or this feedback a lot of what has been said. I've seen you writing notes. But just give us your perspective on how this was for you and whether it's something different you've had today or you've just been hearing the same thing over and over. Yeah, I think uh, this conversation is very good and it needs to be carried forward. Uh, startups, by nature, may not be taken very seriously individually. But if there's a forum, as has been suggested here, then we can be able to get their collective needs, their collective lack, a picture, the idea of risk capital, but uh, you won't fund one startup. But if there's a collection of 100 or 500 firms, then I think they can approach government or they can talk and the government will listen to them. So I think that um, startup association needs to come up to be able to engage the government. Yeah. Sounds good. I, I'm particularly fantastic with deadlines as a journalist. Um, today is 24 February. How long do you think we could have this conversation? And till when? When ideally do you think we can have this conversation again about did we set up the startup forum? Did we when did we say two months? Three months we will follow up. Three months? Okay, um, uh, <laughs> let's give it three months. Three months. Yes. February? So May 24th. Yes. At least the end of May. Yes. Okay, perfect. Please, we have cameras, videos. Oh, wait, let me do this actually. <laughs> can, can you just say that again? When, I mean, when, when do we think we can have a conversation on a forum for startups? At least for people to come and air what they're going to tell us that in the next three months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The camera might not have been recording, but that pressure was real. <laughs> Please, just final word. Of course, TBL have been having this in partnership, but we'd like to hear your final word, given the collective thoughts we have. Well, I know that the uh, yes, coming to talk to us about to convening this forum for you, so that's why I'm laughing. I'm sure it'll come back to us. Um, now, I think what's really important for us at TBI, you know, we have moved into supporting tech. We do a lot of support in other areas as well. But we've moved into supporting tech because we do believe that it's going to be the great enabler. Um, and, you know, we work with governments uh, because in the end, the changes have to come from them, right? Um, and so for us, partnerships are very important. And it's not just partnership with government, but it's also partnership with the private sector. And again, as I said, this convening role. Because we embed and and so we, we we want to support governments and startups and these kind of forums to come together because um, tech is going to be the thing in all of the sectors. If you look at the big four, if you look at Vision 2030, all of it is going to be enabled by tech. Um, for me, one of the big things is um, how tech can enable food security. That to me is a critical thing. Um, obviously, the other areas like health and so on, but the me food security is a huge opportunity. If our ministries are going to be are, are going to grab that opportunity um, and look at it in the right way. So if you look at the iData platform, that can bring all things together, as Michelle keeps talking about, you know, the single source of truth. But governments have to be. It's not just um, uh, startups that have to be bold. Governments have to be bold. And they have to take big steps. Um, some of our partners are doing that. Some are more uh, shy of doing that. But I think it's, it's the entire ecosystem. And even though we say that the startups 
they let, they'll take initiative and so on. In the end, um, countries with very strong tech environments have governments that back very strong tech environments. Thank you very much. Please, a warm round of applause to our panelists. When we started the session, I, when we started the session, we said, of course, there's many issues. You have a lot of players that come on board, the stakeholders, the DeFi guys, the crypto guys, uh, stage one investors, series B funders. There's a lot of things, a lot of people that we can't quite have a solution and even to 1% of the problems that we face within the tech world. But all we can do is think and move together in a very jointed manner. If we're gonna have these jointed communities, at least let's have a jointed mindset as we, as we move forward and then we'll work as we carry on. So to everyone who asked the question, uh, give the perspective, the five of you, the feedback coming from here, and to all of you for engaging me even as we continue, we really appreciate it. I've been a moderator, George Indirango, we can chat after, I'm sure you'll want to speak to the panelists after this, but thank you for creating your time and giving us your care. Thank you.